Welcome to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. My name is Jim Schof. I'm a senior fellow here in the Asia program. And it is my uh, distinct honor to, to welcome you here to a very special lecture uh, given by Professor Ezra Vogel uh, down from, uh, from Harvard on understanding China-Japan relations from 1945 to 2019. Uh, I'd also like to express my thanks to the Saskawa Peace Foundation USA uh, and its chairman and, and, C, uh, and president, uh, Satohiro Akimoto, um, and his whole team, uh, because they made Ezra's visit possible here. We're pleased to be able to offer the venue, uh, but they really uh, made it happen. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Ezra, I think for the first time about 20 years ago, uh, when I was at the US Japan Foundation, and Ezra uh, was a grantee leading a project uh, that examined the role of history uh, in the modern triangular relationship of the United States, Japan, and China. And uh, I've been grateful ever since that our paths continue to cross from time to time. So thank you for, for coming down and being with us here today. Um, you all probably know Ezra uh, very well, but for the sake of our recording today, we'll be making a, 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 this available on the web later. I'll, I'll offer a, a brief introduction. Uh, Ezra uh, Vogel is the Henry Ford II Professor uh, of the Social Sciences Emeritus at Harvard University. Uh, and his career at Harvard spans uh, well over 50 years, uh, spending a good portion of that time in China and Japan as well. Uh, he also spent two years here in Washington uh, as the National Intelligence Officer for East Asia uh, at the National Intelligence Council from 1993 to 95. Uh, Ezra's previous book, uh, Deng Xiaoping and the Transformation of China, uh, was award-winning. Uh, and his new book, China and Japan, Facing History, uh, is already receiving very uh, solid reviews. And we have flyers available, I think, on your seats uh, that describe about the book, describe the book, and how you can uh, get a copy. But of course, first we get treated to a lecture uh, by Ezra based on the book. Uh, so before we begin the lecture, I'd like to yield the podium uh, to someone who knows Ezra better than I do, uh, my friend and our co-sponsor uh, today, Dr. Satohiro Akimoto. Uh, as I mentioned before, Akimoto-san is uh, the chairman and president of the Saskawa Peace Foundation USA, and I think this is his first uh, event now with the, the new title of chairman, so congratulations uh, to Satohiro as well. Um, I give you the floor. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank Carnegie Endowment for International Peace for making this wonderful event possible. I especially like to uh, thank Jim and also Ambassador uh, Doug Paul, uh, who are instrumental in uh, bringing uh, Ezra down to uh, Washington. I am really delighted to see you all. I'm really delighted because uh, uh, when I first uh, proposed Ezra's talk at 4:30 in the evening, I got a warning saying that uh, not many people will show up for a late afternoon event starting at 4:30. So I said to myself, "Well." You know, this is a special event featuring Ezra Vogel. Many people should show up. There must be something wrong with the people in Washington if we have very little people with the talk with Ezra. There are actually something seriously wrong with some people in Washington, but uh, uh, that's a subject matter for a different day. So I'm really delighted to have Ezra Vogel in Washington. There is no need for an introduction for Ezra Vogel. So uh, uh, I'll be very quick. And also know that uh, you didn't come to listen to me. So I'll be very polite. First, uh, 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 just uh, my personal observation of Ezra. First, uh, uh, I've never seen a professor who is willing to spend so much time, so much energy with his student or her student. I was a long time student uh, uh, in my life. I spent uh, almost like 15 years as a university student, a graduate student in United States, UK, Russia, former Soviet Union, and Japan. I have met wonderful, wonderful teachers, wonderful, wonderful professors. I'm grateful to all of them. However, nobody spent as much time, as much energy as Ezra did. And this is not limited to his star students. We have some star students in this room. I, as an average student at best, actually lost Ezra to Washington when I was at the latter part of my graduate work. I was really worried 
that uh, uh, I may not be able to get continuous guidance from Ezra from Washington. As you remember, some of you are old enough to remember that was a time when we communicate using uh, uh, fax machines and a rolled paper, not a computer and an email. But as soon as Ezra arrived in Washington, my fax machine started to buzz. His advices, encouragement, suggestions, and so on and so forth. And obviously, I don't know how he did it, because I'm sure that he was very busy. But, and also, I was not the only student he was taking care of at the time. But I'm, I'm so grateful. Second, Ezra always talks about the importance of uh, uh, having a big vision, big argument. This is not to diminish the importance of acquiring detailed knowledge and the nuanced interpretation of a subject matter. On the contrary, Ezra always stresses the importance of mastery of minute details of a subject matter, and which is evident in all the academic work that he has done. What he's saying is that it is important sometimes to step back and think about big picture, big argument, based on <clears throat> the nuanced understanding, detailed knowledge that you have acquired. China and Japan facing history is a book of big vision, big argument, based on the mastery of encyclopedic knowledge of Sino-Japanese relationship in the context of geopolitics, history in Northeast Asia. And this is a book that only Ezra can write. We always talk about the importance of uh, role models, and Ezra spent lifetime setting an example as a teacher, as a researcher, as an advisor, as a supporter, and a friend. I'm really grateful for all the support, kindness, generosity that Ezra has given me over the years. I am determined to use or take advantage of the training that I got from Ezra, kindness to other people that he taught me, to uh, uh, connect people in the United States and Asia, and also connect people among Asian nations. This is my limited and small way of repaying Ongaishi to Ezra Sensei uh, in my capacity. So uh, uh, Ezra, thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> it's a special pleasure to be here, uh, having spent the last seven years working on a book and to talk about it. And to talk about it in Washington to very knowledgeable people, including a lot of old friends. Although I only spent two years in Washington, I learned to have great respect for many of the people who serve in Washington, who have more knowledge and contribute more and are more dedicated than most Americans realize. And I think particularly at this juncture, when so many people <clears throat> are down on and not fully using the expertise. I want to express my appreciation and respect for the people in Washington, many of you in this room, who have that expertise and deserve to be listened to uh, many, much more. I tell my friends in Asia that one of the good things about American democracy is that uh, no matter what goes on in Washington, and even if uh, you might disagree with the very highest official in the uh, country and find reasons to be critical of the American president, that we in the university are allowed to express our opinion fully and do research as we see fit. And <clears throat> the good thing about being in the university, I think, is that we are able to continue working on the same subject at our own will, and we are not uh, shuffled around by organizations to do so many different jobs. <clears throat> so while I don't know a lot about many parts of the world, I have been able to work on Asia continuously uh, since I uh, started doing research as a, as a postgraduate student in, in 1958 in Japan. And since 1958, I've had the opportunity to visit Japan at least once a year. And uh, although the first time I got to China was 1973, uh, after the, by the late 1980s, I was able to visit China at least once a year, every year. So I've been able to have continued opportunity. Uh, one thing I uh, envy about many people in Washington is that they have whole staffs to work for them. Uh, and at the universities, uh, people go about their own thesis and you can give them some advice. Uh, 
but you don't have people to collect information for you and to organize it. And it's, you're, you're more of a loner, uh, which has some advantages, but I also recognize it has disadvantages. <clears throat> what I thought I could do today that would be most helpful about the things that I've been studying for the last seven years is describe the, the period since World War II, because I think it's most relevant to the current situation. <clears throat> and I think those of us in the academy have a chance to look at the, the broad picture uh, and are under less pressure than you people here in Washington to talk about the current situation. So what I thought I would do is give that broad picture uh, as I see it since 1945. Uh, and it's also uh, uh, roughly the, my career time, and, and I see these friends in the audience who have roughly the same uh, age, uh, roughly the same age as I am, who also span that broad period. So I'm talking about the period uh, that I've uh, personally experienced. <clears throat> I thought I would start by saying a few words about the ending of World War II, and then uh, even I, uh, when I start writing about it, I, I change my periodization. But I think one way to periodize the period since uh, Beijing uh, turned communist in 1949, and I will, I will talk about four periods today, that a period from 1949 <clears throat> uh, up till about 1972 uh, during the Cold War, then the period from 72 to 92, which I think was kind of a golden age of relations between China and Japan, uh, and then from 93 uh, to 2008, or uh, 2012, uh, maybe 2014, I should say. The two, um, uh, period from about 1993 to 2014, when China was passing Japan as the dominant uh, power of Asia. And then the period uh, since 1914, as they've tried to, Japan and China have tried to come to terms with each other. <clears throat> At the end of World War II, uh, of course, uh, Japan uh, was uh, not just defeated, but the whole spirit was destroyed ever since the Meiji when they were trying to become a modern country and they developed such ambitions to be so completely defeated. Now, in, in the United States, of course, we think the United States defeated Japan in the Pacific War, uh, and we have good reason to feel that way. It was our bombing and the atomic bombs at the end. Uh, that uh, <clears throat> ended the war. But from the Chinese point of view, uh, they uh, weighted down uh, China uh, ever since 1931-37. And without weighing down China, uh, that the war would never have ended. Uh, there is one uh, interesting uh, Japanese uh, uh, Chinese general that I think it deserves to be better known in the United States, uh, United States and the world. His name is Zhang Bai-li. He was uh, head of the uh, uh, Tianjin, uh, of, of the uh, Baoding Military Academy. He went to Japan uh, to study uh, early in the 19, uh, 20th century and attended the Japanese Military Academy. The year he graduated from the Japanese Military Academy, he was first in the class. The second in the class is also Chinese. Uh, and after that, he became a close friend of a lot of the generals. And in the 1930s, uh, even in the late 20s, he already began to see that he thought that the intention of Japan would be to invade China, and that, that knowing how they thought and the way the politics were going, that uh, <clears throat> Japan would probably invade China, and that China could not stand up to Japan. Japan would be much stronger. But Japan, China would lose. Japan would lose to China in the end by protracted warfare. China could outweigh them, outlast them, and therefore, in the end, uh, Japan would lose. Even though Japan had a superior military, could invade, take win battles, that China would lose in the long run. He told that to Chiang Kai-shek, and uh, later Mao wrote a famous article on protracted, uh, protracted war. But actually, it was Chiang Bai Li who really gave this advice at a much earlier time. And <clears throat> so from the Chinese point of view, it was the strategy uh, of, of Zhang Wei the, who really won uh, World War II. And so when Chinese say they won World War II and defeated the Japanese, uh, there, there is a different perspective. 
than those of us Americans who uh, think of all the, the battles in the Pacific and the bombing over Tokyo and the atomic bombs at the end. <clears throat> uh, from the point of view of uh, Japanese, uh, they, they, they also had put so much into the economy, partic particularly in what China called the Northeast and Japan called Manchuria, uh, and had developed such high levels of technology and had so many people living there that uh, in 1945, not only uh, was J J Japan so heavily wounded by the loss of their industry in Manchuria, but the Russians and the Chinese communists and the Chinese nationals all ru rushed, wanted to rush in Manchuria because of the legacy that la the Japan had left technologically in the Northeast. Uh, because Japan <clears throat> had felt that heavy industry would be required in a long war, and that within Japan, they didn't always have the iron ore and all the other facilities in the space. Uh, in the 1930s, they really developed uh, Manchuria and coal mining and uh, high technology just across the border in Korea. Uh, they had a, a good chemical industry for fertilizer, but also for ammunition that they could use. And so there was a very high level of technology that they left. And why did the Ch Chinese communist troops try to rush to the Northeast immediately after 1945, it's, it's to take over some of that Japanese property, uh, the Japanese weapons that were left there, and to get the technology. And even the first five-year plan, we think of it as Russian aid to China, and there was a tremendous amount, more than the Chinese uh, always admit uh, later on. But even though that was from the Russian aid, the places where they built was on the base that Japan had established in the Northeast in the 1930s. And so that was uh, an enormous uh, industrial base. And also there were so many Ch uh, Japanese people in the Northeast. <clears throat> At the end, in a, in a funny kind of way, the Japanese were more cosmopolitan during their height of nationalism than they were later. And, and I mean in, in this sense, that um, they, when they took over Taiwan and later uh, Korea and Manchuria, they thought of those people as kind of Japanese subjects. And they, they were, in a certain sense, uh, Japanese. And they not only learned Japanese, and they attended Japanese schools, they received a Japanese education, so that the meaning of being Japanese was somewhat broader. It was not just the narrow uh, Japanese, uh, narrow definition of Japanese race who'd been born in Japan, always lived there. Uh, they were Japanese subjects. And a lot, a lot of the most talented people in those places uh, attended university in uh, had attended university in Japan. Uh, Lee Dong Hui had gone to a Japanese university. Pa uh, Park Chung Hee had taken part in the Japanese military, uh, and uh, they were, in a certain sense, partly Japanese. So, but at the end of 1945, the meaning of Japanese was again narrowed down just to the people who grew up in Japan. So that meant that the Koreans who were living in Japan were no longer sort of part of the nation. They were separate, they were more uh, separated. And the same was uh, true for Chinese in Japan. They were, they were more separated. There, there, there was a certain sense in which Japanese-ness included the colonies. And compared to the European colonies in Africa and Asia, which were far from the home country, uh, Japan really made its colonies much more modern than uh, the uh, European colonies. <clears throat> so now I uh, start from 1949 in that uh, period. By, the, by 1949, the Chinese communists uh, took over the country. It was already the Cold War. And the United States policy, of course, toward the occupation, which had started with uh, the spirit of being tough on Japan, uh, by 1947, in the context of the Cold War, uh, began to change, and we began to allow uh, more Japanese industry to develop, and the Japanese uh, had uh, industrial contributions to the American war effort in Korea. Uh, and so Japanese uh, became, in a way, much uh, more part of the uh, American sphere, and the relations between Japan and the United States, which had been enemies, enemies up to 45, and underwent a, a remarkable change. And a lot of, a lot of the change that went, I think, took 
I think part of the reason our occupation was so successful, not only that we tried to rely on our own best specialists, a handful of them, but that we there was a base of Japan among uh, uh, high officials. They had a well-developed bureaucracy that could manage things. Uh, they had uh, people uh, who had become accustomed to government leadership of industry uh, that they could adapt for industrial growth after uh, World War II. Uh, <clears throat> they also had experience in democracy in the 1920s and 30s that even though not as fully developed uh, and that was snuffed out <clears throat> during the 30s and 40s, but that there was a base of intellectual and personal experience among politicians that made it easier. So when people say we should have an occupation like we did in Japan, there was there was nothing like it before or since, I think, in terms of the scope and depth and therefore uh, the, the uh, contact. And, uh, and although we had been an ally of China in uh, World War II, a fact which the Chinese remind of, us of when they want to be anti-Japanese, uh, they say that, you know, they talk about the great cooperation uh, between America and uh, China during World War II and uh, the Americans who sacrificed themselves uh, in the uh, development of China and working with them. So um, uh, the, the Japanese uh, had been the enemy at that, that time. Uh, and from the Cold War, however, once the uh, Korean War broke out uh, and the Cold War extended to Asia and uh, China uh, leaned to one side toward the Soviet side, uh, they were clearly on the other side of the Cold War. Now, what that meant for Japanese-Chinese relations, of course, is that we, uh, Dulles and others, did not want the Japan Japanese to have too much trade with China. Uh, many Japanese in the 1930s had become convinced that they needed the colonies because uh, they needed more food and they needed industry and so forth, and they needed the economic cooperation of other countries. And they felt very much during the occupation uh, that that was still necessary. And so there were a lot of Japanese who were eager to cooperate in developing and continuing trade that, uh, with China that had started uh, in the pre-World War II period. But the American government uh, very much uh, stopped uh, that and didn't let them. However, dur during this period of the Cold War, the Japanese um, had channels to, to China, and they, they had a trickle of trade, uh, but it was um, uh, certain special channels. For example, in, in, the, in the Liberal Democratic Party, there was a guy named Utsunomiya, uh, who was a, a, a leftist uh, a Kyoto person of, uh, who had been left-wing, but kept getting elected to the, the Japanese diet, uh, who was very left-wing and kept relations uh, with China. And then uh, China also allied with the Socialist Party. Uh, the, tr the trouble with the Communist Party was that they, they became too close to Russia. Uh, I mean, from the Chinese point of view, the, the trouble was they were too close to Russia so that they weren't, the Japanese Communist Party wasn't always a reliable ally for the Chinese. But the Socialists and the Tsunami and others, they had a small channel. <clears throat> and there were a small number of Japanese intellectuals uh, who had um, contact with China. I remember, uh, I think it was around 1967, I visited a uh, radical uh, professor at Waseda University, Ando Hikitaro, and uh, he talked about how he led a delegation of young student movement uh, to meet with the Red Guards in China. And he read them, uh, met them in China. And uh, he said um, uh, there was a lot of agreement, but the one thing uh, that uh, there was a little different point of view is that they thought the uh, Japanese uh, should begin the revolution in the countryside. And the Japanese tried to explain they didn't think that would work very well uh, in Japan, that the, the peasants weren't about ready to start a revolution in Japan. Uh, the next day, I met somebody from the cabinet research office, and uh, he said, oh, I hear, I, I hear you just talked to Ando yesterday. Well, uh, they were on the complete other side of politics. Here was uh, the Cabinet Research Office, uh, the Sequel Intelligence uh, in Japan, saying that uh, they, they knew what this, the left wing in Japan were doing. So that it, it was a funny, funny, I think it was a kind of a funny kind of situation 
where you had a small channel to China from the leftists in Japan, uh, but that they kept up uh, that contact, and there was just just a tickle, trickle of trade. And there, there were a lot of, in, uh, because there had been such deep relationships between certain Chinese and certain Japanese, there was a kind of understanding of the other country, maybe that, uh, uh, not maybe, but the Japanese had been very arrogant in the mainland. Uh, but people like uh, uh, Kishino Busuke had been an economic official there. Uh, people like uh, uh, Yoshida uh, Shigeru had spent many years in uh, China as a diplomat. Uh, and there were a lot of other uh, Japanese leaders. Uh, Tanaka Kakue had done some business in China and the Japanese business community, many of them had served in China and had a kind of instinctive feel. And on the, on the Chinese side too, uh, there were a lot of them who uh, had close contact with Japan. Uh, of course, the leading one in China was Liao Chengzhi. Uh, Liao Chengzhi's uh, grandfather had been a banker and been in San Francisco, but his father, Liao Junkai, uh, was very close to Sun Yat-sen, and there was some thought that he might be Sun Yat-sen's successor until he was shot. Uh, so Liao Junkai was shot, but in, uh, in the period before he was shot, he spent many years in Japan, and Liao Chengzhi was a little kid, uh, went to school in Japan, and uh, they had quite a bit of money from the banker grandpa, and uh, they lived in very comfortable lives, and they had Japanese servants, and sent uh, Liao Chengzhi to a good school, had uh, high-class classmates. And so um, in 1955, when John Lai uh, went to Bandung Conference and tried to have better relations with Japanese, uh, he had Liao Junkai uh, talk uh, to some Japanese. And on the Japanese side, uh, there was a guy named Takasaki Tatsunosuke, uh, and later they developed the Liao Takasaki uh, a trade a memorandum. Now, people don't know enough about Takasaki, but he's a fascinating character. Uh, he, uh, when he, he was uh, in high school, uh, somebody said, you know, Japan needs uh, to it's export in order to survive. We don't have enough. And one thing we could do, we could do fish and put cans, uh, fish canning, and sell those. And we could sell those in the West and earn money so that we could buy things from abroad. So in that time, <clears throat> in his day, there was one uh, fishing kind of commercial high school uh, in Japan, and he, he went to that. And after that, uh, he went to work for the company. And then he was sent by the company to the United States to try to sell the cans. Uh, and the sales were not very good. But he worked several years in the United States and, and found out that Americans had better canning technology uh, than Japan did, even though Japan did a lot of things about the fishing. So he went back to Japan and uh, got the uh, fish canning uh, industry uh, going and brought in some American technology. And before long, he had the biggest uh, can company uh, in Japan. Then in Manchuria, he, when he went to visit there in the 30s, at the time, uh, some of the Japanese bureaucrats in Manchuria wanted uh, to have something closer to socialism. They didn't want to have private companies and a lot of the army people also wanted to have uh, more like a socialist kind of economy. Uh, but uh, in the end, they decided that they, in order to get the dynamism, of, they had to have private enter, uh, en enterprise. And so uh, Takasaki Tatsunosuke was encouraged to go to Manchuria and developed and then became head of the Japanese Manchurian industry. Well, in 1940, at, at the end of the war, uh, he uh, stayed on in Manchuria and some Chinese there wanted Japanese help in keeping those industries open. So they looked to him as a kind of cooperative person, and uh, he wanted to supply the help. So he became head of the Japanese Association of People in Manchuria, because they, uh, there are a lot of stories of the people who got left in Manchuria and didn't get back to the mainland, but uh, the mainland Japan, but in Manchuria, uh, Takasaki played that special role of trying to help Japanese citizens on the one hand, and also being 
uh, available to try to help the, some of the machinery to continue so that the factories that have been developed by the Japanese could continue in Manchuria. Well, he goes back to, uh, to uh, Japan. And so in, <clears throat> when they were trying to develop some kind of trade relationships in the Cold War, uh, Liao Chengzhi, who had spent so much time in uh, Japan, uh, knew Japanese and attended Waseda for a little while, uh, and Takasaki uh, were a perfect match. They, they met at the Bandung Conference, and uh, the politics was not, at the time, enough that they could uh, do much. But they later developed a relationship, and they, they were provided a small amount of trade that could continue uh, even during the Cold War. So you had a, a small group of people, a lot of high-level Japanese uh, who were among the most conservative people who had also served in China. But also you had some people like Takasaki uh, who uh, could be uh, real, real friends of the Chinese. Um, <clears throat> okay, now uh, th then we have the period of 1972 to 19, uh, uh, I trace it to 1992 as a kind of a golden era. Uh, when, you know, J Japan had wanted to trade more with uh, China uh, and the United States didn't much let them during the Cold War. But once um, uh, Kissinger went to China uh, and Nixon was getting ready to go, there was no way of keeping Japan uh, from having contact with China. And they felt uh, uh, cheated by the United States because uh, the United States had been in, encouraged them to vote against uh, their quick entry into the United Nations. We encouraged them to uh, be anti-Chinese, not have any trade. And then here we go, uh, the United States opening up trade before Japan gets a chance. So uh, the, Japan was very upset. And at that time, uh, Sato Eisaku, uh, prime minister, had a terrible relationship with China, and the Chinese were not about to cooperate uh, with Japan. So uh, the Japanese uh, quickly elected another prime minister, uh, and uh, the, the new uh, prime minister, Tanaka Kakoe, uh, immediately uh, went to Beijing. And by the summer of 1972, faster than the United States, they formed uh, formal diplomatic relationship with China. Uh, and uh, I think the mood in the Japanese business community, aha, those American business people were trying to get ahead of us. And uh, if we want to get in the China market, which is so important, we got to go establish our base and we got to move as quickly as we can. And so uh, Tanaka went and in the summer of 1972, uh, long before the United States was ready to have official relations, uh, Japan developed official relations uh, with uh, China at that time. Okay, then uh, after that, the next few years, uh, there, were not a, there was not a consensus between Chinese and Japanese about how to manage enough details so that the normalization of relationship would lead to close business contacts. They, they had uh, trouble uh, getting a, a new treaty uh, that would take care of all kinds of issues. And one of the biggest issues was uh, the, uh, making a, a, a agreement with uh, China, but to China and Japan, against third parties. And uh, Japan was reluctant to sign that because although know, they had bad relations with the Soviet Union, they didn't want to be too clear about it. And so they wouldn't sign an anti-hegemony clause, which was so clearly aimed at the Soviet Union. And so that held up relations, formal relations for a while until about 1978. And then 1978, Deng Xiaoping uh, was coming to power. He was not, it was even before the third plenum. Uh, he was uh, already beginning to see opportunities to work with uh, Japan and wanted to have that new treaty. And so they worked out a, a nice way to say it that uh, they, they would not be discriminating against third parties. And so by having that clever little wording, uh, they uh, got the anti-hegemony clause in, uh, but not against third parties. They wouldn't discriminate. And so they, they, the Japanese judged, they put it that way, Russia wouldn't get too mad and attack them. So they squeaked by. And that normalized relation between Japan and China in 1978 <clears throat> 
Now, Deng Xiaoping already, uh, before he came to power, the third plenum in 1978, December 1978, knew that the two countries that would be important for development would be Japan and the United States. Japan was nearby. He knew that Japanese felt bad about uh, what had happened uh, in World War II and could be counted on even though they, that Jiang Kai-shek let them not have a formal reparations, that they would be willing to make some concessions and make efforts uh, to try to help uh, Japan, uh, uh, to help China. And so he uh, was ready to, to move ahead. Uh, and so he came to Japan in October 1978, uh, before two months before the third plenum in December 1978. And he came to Japan and he visited a number of places. First of all, he rode on the Shinkansen, the fast train. At the time, China had zero mileage of fast train. As you know, now they have about as much as the rest of the world combined. Uh, and how quickly they were able to do that. So he rode on the fast train, and clearly that was, he made that clear that that was something that uh, China wanted to learn the technology. Yeah, he visited several factories. One was New Japan Steel. Uh, he visited uh, Kimitsu across the bay in Tokyo, which was then probably the world's most advanced steel-making plant, and had already been signed up to uh, be the model for Baoshan, uh, the first Chinese steel plant. And he wanted that, that to move further and faster, and uh, so he visited that, that plant. Uh, to help uh, uh, the role of steel. He also wanted to be, think about the automobile industry, and he visited Nissan's factory. Uh, this is a different Nissan than one that's in trouble today. Uh, and uh, uh, Nissan had uh, some of the most advanced robots uh, in the world at the time, and so he visited the plant, Nissan plant, not too far outside of Tokyo, uh, to get a sense of automobile. And then he went down to Osaka. And Osaka, it, oh, uh, to show the, the, Ch the Chinese kind of way of doing diplomacy and winning the hearts and minds, uh, he, uh, in Tokyo, even though Tanaka was by that time in, in jail, or, no, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, house arrest, he was under house arrest, uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping insisted on seeing him. And so he was allowed to go visit uh, Tanaka Kakue. And, uh, you know, uh, those who drink from the well remember uh, who built the well, and we thank you for normalizing relations with China. And then he went down to Osaka, and Takasaki Tatsunosuke was dead by that time, but he insisted on visiting a daughter of Takasaki to express his appreciation. And then he went on to meet the guy he called the god of modern enterprise, uh, Matsushita Tomonosuke. And this is, of course, long before the computer uh, and uh, internet revolution, in those days, uh, the idea of getting television into China loomed very large, radio and television, and they looked to Matsushita, and uh, before long, Matsushita had some plants in China. So uh, Deng had laid the basis for this barring of technology, and during the 1980s, I, I say this was the kind of the golden age because China was very welcome. I remember going to some factories uh, when I was working under Mark Bratt here, here in Guangzhou, and to some factories they said, you know, in big signs, we're using modern Japanese technology and modern uh, Japanese management system uh, on, the, on the signs and the factories. Uh, and so they were really trying to uh, make good use of it, and the Japanese were quite generous, and even Jetro uh, set up a study council, so if China said they wanted uh, uh, to learn certain technology, Jetro tried to arrange that they would arrange, they would do that. And just as in the 1950s, Americans were quite confident that our technology was so far ahead of Japanese that they would be happy to show Japanese technology, that wasn't quite true in the 1980s, but in the 1950s it was. And in the same way, uh, China was so far behind that Japanese were quite confident they could keep far ahead and they were quite generous in keeping that technology, and up through uh, 92. Now, the reason I use 92 is that from the period 89 after the Tiananmen incident, uh, the, a lot of the world was a little slow in recognizing uh, China. They wanted to 
uh, punish China for for cramping down, clamping down on Tiananmen, the horrible uh, tragedy where so many people were killed. And so they were breaking relations. And among the foreign countries, uh, Japan was most willing to, to continue relations. And so they were quite welcomed and played quite a, a role. They, they had some sanctions, but not as much as other countries. In 1992, uh, there, there was a very unusual event that I wish history talked more about it. I haven't, don't see it much in the history books. The Japanese emperor, one time in the his course of history of 2,000 years of contact, visited China in 1992. Uh, the Chinese emperor has never visited Japan, so that was absolutely unique. And it was, from the Chinese side, it was a way of trying to get Japan uh, to uh, help break the uh, restraint that other countries had in recognizing China in international affairs. Uh, but for the Japanese, uh, it was an opportunity to uh, help further the peaceful relations and development of good relations. <clears throat> uh, this continued until 1992. Uh, then what happened in 1993? Uh, first of all, I think by the 1992, uh, the other countries had begun to stop their sanctions. So Japan did not loom quite as uh, critical uh, for breaking the outside sanctions uh, that wasn't quite that important to have take advantage of special relationships. But also, uh, Deng Xiaoping, as a result of the Tiananmen incident, had decided that China needed patriotic education. Uh, but in the Cultural Revolution, they still had class struggle. So the, the motivating, driving force of who you're against, you're against uh, the capitalist class, you were against uh, the exploiters, the, the, uh, the landlords. But uh, Deng realized under the new uh, program that uh, there were going to be people in business and you couldn't have class war against capitalists and still have openness to business. Uh, so uh, he, instead of having class warfare, he uh, substituted patriotism and tried to develop patriotic educations campaign. The, at first, it wasn't so much against Japan, but within two or three years, if you if you were a local propaganda official in China uh, and your responsibility was to stir up anti-foreign feeling and get patriotism, nothing worked like anti-Japanese because so many people had experienced the horrible things that Japanese did in World War II. So uh, the, the Chinese, uh, they taught their young people. And some of the, the most anti-Japanese feelings among China uh, were not among the people who had uh, experienced World War II. That was plenty bad. But the younger generation who saw all those movies, and those of you who visited China uh, in the late 90s and the early 2000s, uh, know that it was, it was not difficult to find anti-Japanese movies on Chinese TV. Uh, I think one year they produced something like 100 anti-Japanese warfare uh, movies. Uh, and so, and they, they were very clever, the modernization of, of propaganda. Uh, they developed kids' games where you could use uh, various kinds of uh, games where you could beat the Japanese in warfare in the games. And so the anti-Japanese feelings uh, became really very, very, uh, strong beginning in, in the late uh, 1990s. Uh, now, uh, I, I describe this as the period when China was overtaking uh, Japan because by 19, you know, 1989 and 93, the, Japanese, uh, the Chinese growth rate had slowed way down because of the foreign sanctions. But, but by 1993, those sanctions had pretty much ended. And the growth rate in China was something like 13, 14% a year that year, 93. So it was clear that China was on a roll and the economy was going to grow very rapidly. And they could begin to see that someday they were going to pass Japanese economy. They didn't know when, but even if it wasn't 13% of growth rate, it was 8 or 9 or 10%, uh, they could see that before long they were going to pass Japan. And, and as we got closer to that day, the year, the year 2010 is the year the World Bank said the Chinese economy has passed Japan's. Uh, 
in 2005, already when Japanese soccer teams were going to China and beating the teams, it was a lot of patriotism, a lot of anti-Japanese feeling that was expressed. And by 2008, I think the Chinese could feel their victory coming very soon. They were going to pass Japan very soon. Uh, 2008, they had the Olympics and the uh, Asia financial crisis. So that made the whole Western uh, econo economic system no longer seem quite as powerful. And they could see themselves breathing down uh, the Japanese. And <clears throat> uh, already in 2005, there were with the soccer team thing, there had been uh, trashing of Japanese shops in China. Uh, and uh, by 2008, they were really very confident. Then 2010, we have the collision of the uh, Chinese ship that rammed into the Japanese ship. And then Japanese faster ships uh, circled it and uh, tried to stop it. And then the, ja and the Chinese ship again rammed to second place. Uh, later, uh, it was an, it was quite clear that the Japan the Chinese captain of that ship was drunk, uh, but uh, it, the incident was used to sort of test uh, the will, and uh, the uh, Chinese insisted that the captain be turned over. Uh, they, they insisted that everything be returned right away, and the captain be turned over. The Japanese view was. Uh, that he had, he had committed a crime, and, and while the usual pattern was to return ships that, that had uh, uh, were waded into Japanese waters, that the, the accident against Japanese ships required a, a court thing, and so they insisted on that. So in 2010, you had a very tense thing, and the Chinese uh, pushed it all the way up until they kept escalating until the Japanese felt they had to give in. So. The way I think about it is this, that in 1895, suddenly, in the first time in history, Japan had passed China, and it came as a shock to the Chinese. It happened as a result of warfare, the Sino-Japanese War of 1894 to 95. When the war began, many Chinese didn't think that, that Japan could do much at all, and they thought of Japan as a, they didn't even bother getting information about, I think one of the big differences why Japan won that war is they had so much more detailed information about China, but the Chinese didn't even care. They didn't think Japan was worth bothering about. So there was a, a Huang Yongxian, the, the guy, number two guy in the Japanese, in the Chinese office in uh, Tokyo, who had gone after 1877 when they diplomatic relations were established and had been there and written quite a good book on Japan. The book wasn't even published in China until after the war. Nobody was that interested. They didn't think there could be any interest. It was the best written, best, no, most knowledgeable book about Japan that was in, written by a Chinese person. Not even you. But so in 1895, the Japanese were suddenly in charge. And even though after World War II, it was no longer military, the economic power was still so much that the Japanese who went to China in the 1980s uh, they, they were not as nasty uh, as uh, the, the warriors in the World War II, uh, but from the Chinese point of view, they were arrogant. And so from the Chinese point of view, after 2010, damn it, now things have changed, and now you bow down. It's your turn. And 2012, uh, there was an, another incident. It's a kind of a funny thing. As you know, uh, it was called the nationalization of the Senkaku Diaudao Island thing. Uh, it was really the, the private property had been sold to the government. And uh, I think many of you know, know the story of it. It's not worth going into the details of that. But the, the result of that was that the uh, Chinese called it nationalization. And the, I, I talked to some people who should be in a position to know they thought that the Chinese diplomats at that time knew that there was a difference between nationalization and private property ownership. Uh, but it was called nationalization, and the Chinese again escalated up until the Japanese bowed down. So I think what happened then between uh, about 2008, when the Ch Chinese became very confident, and about 2012, when the Japanese had bowed down as a real of both those incidents, that the whole fundamental order in East Asia had changed, uh, that China was now in charge. 
in the 1880s, uh, Fukuzawa Yukichi said that we should not look to East Asia, uh, not look to China for uh, leadership examples, you look to the West. Uh, and I think that the truth is that the Japanese looked down on the Chinese government and technology and organization and uh, <clears throat> industrial skills. Uh, but by 2012, uh, they could begin to see that China had made some real advances and that there were some very bright Chinese officials and China had their act together much better. And so they no longer looked down on China the way they had. So I, th I think there was a fundamental shift in the, the, who was in charge uh, in uh, Asia, who was, who was on the top and who was on the bottom between that time period. So that by 2012, uh, China felt in charge. And then I think beginning 2014, they realized the tensions were so uh, great. The danger of a collision was so great, they had to begin to work together and cooperate to begin to tone it down. So I think that's the situation we have since 2014. There's been an attempt to bring some kind of stability. And the last couple of years, I think we've made some additional progress. To me, uh, that stability rests on the capacity of both countries to have long-term leadership and to have fairly stable leadership. I think during the days when, for a decade, when Japan trained to change prime minister almost every year, you didn't have the stable leadership and government organization that you could really negotiate new kind of conditions. And I think in the Chinese case, uh, they had stable leadership, but Japan didn't. But I think, uh, and Abe, uh, I think after he came to power, <clears throat> had a sufficient base in conservative support that he could begin step by step slowly to develop better relations with China. I think that Hatoyama Yukio had enunciated uh, he wanted you know, he went to Beijing before he went to uh, Washington and he wanted to show that he had very good relations, but he didn't have the political base to carry it out. I think that to advance and improve their relations, stabilize their relation, both sides they had to have fairly stable leadership. Uh, that had the respect and they could carry the support of their people. And after that, I think that was possible. Um, <clears throat> I think now that what's happened then is that the two countries are beginning to form a more stable relationship. And uh, the ja Japanese leadership in Beijing uh, in the embassy have worked very hard to go step by step, uh, you know, uh, Li Keqiang visits Japan, Abe visits uh, China. Uh, there's a meeting which, uh, in, Ch in Japan that uh, Xi Jinping attends. Uh, and next spring, after Abe visited uh, China, uh, next spring and the cherry blossom time, uh, it's quite possible that Xi Jinping will have a state visit uh, to Japan. So uh, we shouldn't begin to think that this is going to be a complete day and night. but. Uh, I think, uh, you know, for years people have been saying that you had hot economics and cold politics. I think uh, it is possible now to have moderately hot economics and uh, lukewarm politics. Uh, and I think, I think what is possible now, uh, given the great tension between the United States and China, that uh, China's patriotic uh, instincts can be focused more on the United States. They don't need Japan quite as much. But I think many Japanese believe that uh, uh, given certain kind of conditions, they could again be the object of uh, Chinese ire. And so <clears throat> even though Chinese attitudes toward Japan have improved the last several years, Japanese attitudes toward Japan, uh, China are still much more cautious. But the, the, they know that uh, that's the market. They have more trade with China than they do with the United States and economics. They're going to continue to find ways to expand those relationships. So I think what the prospects are now are that um, there will be uh, next year a significant improvement when Xi Jinping. I think that Xi Jinping wants to show that he can succeed with Japan, getting they need more investing. In the United States is not investing. Some of the European countries are not uh, 
inside about investing in China. But Japan, I think, has the potential for somewhat increasing its investment in China. In China. And I think Xi Jinping, if he goes to Japan next spring, as we expect in cherry blossom time, that that might uh, advance. Well, that's a, a race through uh, my quick picture of uh, China-Japan last 70 uh, years. And so I welcome your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ezra. So I, I think Ezra will will take the questions himself, but please wait for a microphone, which will be delivered to you, and uh, let us know who you are, and, and you can ask your question. Thanks so much. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm Chen Liu from China Xinhua News Agency, and uh, thanks, Mr. Vogel, for your wonderful lecture. And my question is just about the role of the United States in the U.S.-Japan ties. You've touched upon that um, a little bit at the end of your lecture, so can you just elaborate on it more about um, how important do you think the uh, factor of the, uh, the United States has been in the U.S.-Japan uh, ties? And nowadays, we know that uh, uh, China-Japan ties, and nowadays we know that um, because of the growing tension between China and uh, the U.S., um, the United States is um, kind of campaigning around the world to try to form a um, kind of um, coalition against China. So um, to what extent do you think that you, uh, the U.S., um, this kind form of a campaign could uh, be successful? Thank you. I think that, uh, of course, since the uh, Trump period it has emphasized what's good for America and has been weak on alliances. And even though Abe has managed to maintain a more or less satisfactory relationship with the United States, I think they feel that uh, they cannot rely quite as completely on the United States as they could. Um, I think in terms of uh, defense strategy, because China now has, has, the economy is about twice as large as Japan's, and their military expenses are much, much more than Japan's. I think that uh, Japanese leaders will want to keep the basic security relationship with the United States. I don't see that as changing. But I think on other areas, we, we like on how trade issues and so forth, since America pulled out of TPP, and the Japan has tried to take the leadership, the greater leadership in Asian trade issues, that there will be a quiet, uh, moderate separation from the United States. If I were Japanese, I'd try to assure the Americans that our relationship has not changed, that we still have a good relationship, we still value. And I think it is true that uh, democratic comfort with, uh, you know, the operations of democracy in Japan and comfort in the United States is much greater than Japanese comfort in China. But I, I do think that on economic issues, uh, the Japanese will quietly try to look after their own interests and may try to increase uh, the ties not only with China but with uh, other Southeast Asian countries. Unfortunately, the relationship with Korea is such a mess that it's hard to see how Japan can improve that very much very quickly. But I think with other countries, it will make a real effort to try to improve their linkages uh, without uh, too much annoying the United States. That's my guess. Uh, whoever is, who has the mic? I mean, do you, want, do you want me to call on the people? Oh my God. Uh, well, first I'll call on my friend Maria Solis. Uh, so come up here. Thank you very much, Ezra, for that wonderful lecture. And as a former student of yours, it's really uh, a pleasure to be here for this occasion. I wanted to ask you about this new period in the um, Japan-China relations. How far can this stabilization go? Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, Japanese investment in China can grow. But I think uh, when I visit Tokyo, I frequently hear how much, even during this period where things are looking up, uh, Chinese um, assertiveness near the Senkaku Islands has not let up. 
So the territorial question still looms large. Then I think about the economic statecraft agenda that you alluded to, and Japan is championing a model for digital economy that's in sharp contrast to uh, China's own vision of internet sovereignty and uh, cyber protectionism. And even on infrastructure, there's room for cooperation, but Japan is pushing for standards that are somewhat or very different from uh, Chinese standards. So to get a clear, realistic sense of how far can these new stabilization go, uh, um, what are your thoughts? If, if we look at what China has done in the Senkaku Diaoyudao area, uh, they've kept up the pressure. Uh, they, they apparently don't go uh, send uh, troops, uh, send boats quite as often as they did, but they've kept up the pressure. And it seems quite clear that they still have that card. They're keeping that card. They're not willing to sacrifice that card. So I think that place limits on how much uh, you know Japan can feel about security. In terms of Chinese public opinion, it's already changed more than J Japanese public opinion. As you know, several years ago, nearly 90% of both countries didn't like the other country. And now that figure has gone down in China, 10, 20%. Uh, part of that, of course, is the tourists. Uh, 10 years ago, I don't know, one or two million uh, J Chinese tourists a year. Last year, it passed eight million tourists a year. And the tourists come back from Japan the, 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 what you hear from what I've heard from my Chinese friends, it's clean. Uh, they aren't behaving like soldiers of World War II. They're, they're polite, uh, and uh, it's a peaceful society, and there are a lot of things that we can learn from that place. So I think that has provided a broader base within China for improved relations. But on things that you mentioned, like standardization of international internet and so forth, uh, I think that's going to be much harder, and I don't see any signs that the, the Chinese are giving up on Senkaku Diaoyudao. So I think those things will remain, but I, I do think there's a good chance that next year, if Xi Jinping wants more investment uh, from Japan in China, he doesn't expect much more American investment, but next spring might be a good opportunity to get, and I think that uh, they will be courting Japanese firms to make bigger investment. And I think by next spring, that's quite possible. So I think that the, the economic, the, if you do trade figures I, I, and investment figures, I think there's a good chance those can go up, even if some of the more complicated things would be difficult. Uh, I think you're, you're next and, and then you're next, yeah. Introduce yourself, please. Um, good evening and uh, welcome to Washington. Uh, my name is Julian Kyle Lewis from Georgetown University. And uh, my question is um, concerning the nuclear facilities that used to line the coast of Japan. Um, they were, uh, there were um, a lot of disagreements about uh, why the United States was allowing uh, the accumulation of those nuclear facilities on the coastline of Japan until uh, there was a shift in the um, tectonic plates um, a little off the coast of Japan that caused a 100-foot tsunami that wiped out the entire coastline and all of those nuclear facilities. So could you um, talk about um, the Chinese perspective and how China responded to that and what they thought about um, the accumulation of uh, that type of arsenal and the sudden uh, disenvolvement of all of that. Thank you very much. Um, I think in terms of aid uh, in emergencies, there has been little progress between China and Japan. And so when the Sichuan earthquake took place in China, Japanese were allowed to and did send people in. And after the tsunami struck uh, Japan's Tohoku area, the, the Chinese were allowed to send in some efforts to aid that. So I think in, in, the, in the efforts of providing aid, that, that's one of the more positive areas uh, where the relationship has made some progress. Um, in terms of uh, nuclear, the broad question of nu nuclear development, I think, as I read the mood in Japan, I'm sure there are people here who know much more than I, 
that the nuclear allergy in Japan is just so strong that they're going to have trouble keeping three or four nuclear plants open. And as much as uh, it may be logical in terms of uh, keeping down, uh, th you know, uh, waste materials, uh, that uh, I, I just don't see it happening from my, my talks with Japanese. Uh, yes, you're, you're the next. Yeah. Hi, Ezra. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity of speaking today and also for allowing me to help you with this book way back when at, at Harvard uh, called Comeback. Uh, in the, and, and my question is, is a lead off of that. It's Kevin Murphy, uh, by the way. Um, in, in those days, many in the United States were afraid that we had fallen behind Japan in many of our industries, our technologies, our management systems. There was a lot of insecurity. Uh, and, and you wrote this book to reassure Americans that uh, while we could learn from the Japanese, there were a lot of things that we were doing right in terms of business, government, relations here, etc. So fast forward to today, I think there are a lot of people in the United States that are very nervous uh, and insecure about their economy, their industries relative to China. Now, if you were to write a, a, a new comeback, uh, to, to reassure Americans, or look at this, not to reassure necessarily, but to look at the situation. What would you say, knowing the Chinese economy, knowing where it's going, knowing the American economy, what would you say to Americans today who are very nervous and insecure about falling behind China? Well, Kevin, it's nice to see you again. <laughs> uh, the way I would describe what I was trying to do there is not to praise America, but to say, look, we gotta do more to come back. And there are a lot of things that America can do and we should be having more government business cooperation. We should, you know, uh, taking more initiatives. And I think with uh, China, I mean, I the reason I wrote Japan is number one uh, was not as the reason it sold. I think is because people misread my meaning. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think I think uh, the reason it sold is that they they thought that meant that uh, Japan was really passing the United States economically, and that uh, you know that that's something to worry about. And, you know, American businesses that were trying to get their workers to work harder, I think, you know, like that message. Uh, but what my real message was that there are a lot of institutional structures in Japan uh, where they've done things quite well. The relative equality of income, the high level of general education, their medical system, so forth, uh, their uh, high levels of bureaucracy, bureaucratic talent uh, and structure. I, I thought there were a lot of things in Japan that are worth uh, copying. So what I would say now I mean, I, I go through in my mind what I would do, and I have limited time and energy. And uh, if if I wrote a book that was something like, you know, China is number one, and I I would say, what about you know public transportation? What you know, why can't if China can put up so many rails, why can't the United States do that? I mean, uh, and why can't we move faster? And the speed with which they are introducing all kinds of purchasing techniques and so forth. Um, and they, they, there are so many innovative things that China is doing. <clears throat> My uh, friends at Harvard who work in the public health field uh, who advise China say that the Chinese are enormously eager to learn the best practices in other countries and to see that those best practices are widely used in their country. So what you know, we teach great courses at you know places like Kennedy School and uh, Sice and uh, uh, George Washington and so forth. Uh, we have great university courses, but the Chinese political system, you may say Communist Party, but one of the good things about it is when you when you do something well, then people from other localities come to see it. They teach those programs in other areas. There's a rather quick spread of new ideas to all kinds of parts and their efforts to have you know, good public education even in the backward areas. So if I were writing a book about China as number one, I would, I would not stress Chinese economic power and so forth. I would stress that there are a lot of systems that China, do. We, we Americans don't want the Communist Party here and we don't like what they're doing in Hong Kong, and we don't like the way they are trying to uh, clamp down on free information. That would absolutely be atrocious. We'd never accept that, and we shouldn't. But I think in other areas, uh, 
uh, there, there are cases where their system is doing things that aren't so bad and that uh, we, we would do well to, to look at those more carefully. That's my view. Yes. Can you get it? Yeah. Uh, good evening, and thank you for your time, Dr. Vogel. Uh, my name's uh, Brent, Brent Sadler. Question, I, you mentioned that there's a trend, a, a window of potential warming of relations between Japan and China, and I'm kind of curious if you could talk a little bit more about how Hong Kong and Taiwan, the, with the elections coming up in the early next year, how that plays into that potential trend or might affect it. Uh, I think that uh, Japanese are very concerned about Hong Kong, and I think that uh, is going to be a big block to improving relations between Japan and China. Uh, the Japanese see what's happening there, and somehow I think the Japanese press now has caught on to Hong Kong as a very uh, close uh, thing that they're really very concerned about, and it's having a big impact. Taiwan uh, is even more, and it, it has a long history, of course, because when the Japanese were there, you know, if you compare the Japanese colonies, uh, Korea, Taiwan, Manchuria, the three, the ones where the Japanese had best relation was Taiwan, the worst was Korea, Manchuria was somewhere in between. <coughs> I think what happened in, in Taiwan, excuse me, you didn't have a formal government of Taiwan that had been there before that could serve as a base of common loyalty the way he did in Korea. Because you had a long history of the Chosun dynasty and so forth in Korea, it provided a rallying cry and a sense of nationalism, all the things that go with being a country where, Ta where Taiwan is just a little island. And when uh, General Nogi came in after the Sino-Japanese War, he blasted the place, and after two or three years, the place was subdued. And after that, there was not much resistance. And so the relationship between local Taiwanese people and Japanese was not so bad. Uh, the Japanese were a higher position, but they really modernized the place, and uh, the, the Taiwanese are accepted in the school. They went to school you know, in Japan and so forth. They, they went rather well compared to colonies around the world. And I think particularly after the, the Kuomintang moved to Taiwan, a lot of uh, Taiwanese... Uh, who had remembered the Japanese period. Uh, they, may, they may not have been perfectly happy, but they thought the Guomindang was even worse. They cracked down their military. It was much tighter. Uh, they didn't do as much to improve the economy. Uh, and so the Japanese became, in the Taiwan economy, a much more favorable uh, country. And they, the Japanese, when they had their industrial growth and their wages began to go up, and they began to uh, set up factories overseas. They went to the colonies uh, where they had operated. And even in Korea, the uh, people who had served under Japan in the 1930s, Lee byung chol and so forth, the founders of some of the biggest jaibal in Korea, <clears throat> were people who had learned their things under Japan. So I think Japan had quite close relationship with those uh, uh, Taiwanese and the the Taiwan needle with Beijing has been there from the very beginning and the, the uh, Chinese uh, communists have been very worried about the links between Taiwanese people and Japan. Actually I think the ties are not as strong as they were. Uh, Li Denghui, you know, uh, had studied in Japan in, the, in those days. I think Tsai Ing-wen and the new people in Taiwan don't have the depth of contacts with Japan that that earlier generation did. But um, I think that still uh, Taiwan means a lot to the Japanese. That's a long-winded way of saying that uh, I think those are going to be uh, restraints on how far the, the trade between Japan and China can go up and the investments in Japan can go up during the next year or so. Uh, way, way back in the back. Uh, there's someone. Oh, thank you. Uh, Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. I, I was uh, really uh, taken uh, by your uh, remarks about the, uh, the different uh, Japanese colonies. And it's, my question is, uh, 
you, uh, what, what's your view? Or you go along with the uh, the thesis of the late Chalmers Johnson that it was bureaucrats who, 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 who you know, learned their trade in, in building up the industries in, in uh, Manchuria, who then after the war uh, rebooted uh, Japan from uh, total destruction? Uh, Chalmers uh, was a friend of mine, and uh, we disagreed on a lot of things. And Chal <laughs> Chalmers, as you know, he changed his views. Uh, he uh, was at one time rather conservative, and he didn't end up as a conservative. But on that, I, I more or less agree with Chalmers. I think that the uh, bureaucracy in Manchuria was was well developed, and after all, they were they sort of led the industrial development. And they played a very key role, and they had more of a, a kind of a, a uh, industrial plan uh, that was more centralized than they'd had in uh, Japan in the pre-war period. And I think a lot of the planners uh, in uh, the period of 1950s uh, had had uh, experience in Manchuria. Uh, I think that the Japanese did not want to do a socialist like planning like they did in Russia, but they had the idea of the government providing a stimulus. I mean, what, one of the things I think Chalmers said very well was that the United States is a kind of a regulatory state where we have regulations. And as a developmental state, Japan uses officials to try to push the economy forward. And I think. Uh, what they tried to do in the 1950s in a private uh, economy was to play a leading role in sort of stimulating and helping industry advance. That was different from the United States. And I think that uh, China, after 1978, uh, <clears throat> turned to them. Uh, one thing I think it deserves a lot more attention, uh, a Chinese economic planner and vice premier, Gu Mu, uh, developed a relationship uh, with the Japanese former bureaucrats who became uh, his advisors and uh, met annually with them. And I think what appealed to Chinese bureau bureaucrats about that, that group of bureaucrats who led uh, the, Japan's economic development after 1955 was that they were government leadership and trying to promote the economy, but doing it in a free market economy. So what, what can the government as a late developer do to help economic growth in a free market economy? And I think that played uh, a very important role. Uh, and uh, the leader of that group was Okita Saburo. And Okita Saburo, uh, who was uh, one time foreign minister of Japan, uh, grew up in Manchuria. And so he had a particular interest in China. And so uh, and he was a very... Uh, forward-thinking leader, and he was the leader of that Japanese group that advised Gumu and others on their development. And I think that 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 played a very important role. That's a long-winded professorial answer to your question. <laughs> yes, um, right here. Hi, <laughs> Neil.
my, my reading is it that <clears throat> my reading is it that the Soviet contributions in the 1950s and 1960s was greater than a lot of people now say. I mean, and uh, once the China, you know, they had the border clashes in 1969, uh, I think that, that then they t looked uh, back on everything with the Soviets was awful. But um, just my own personal experience, when I would be in Beijing and go to uh, one of the parks on Sunday uh, and uh, listen to all people singing old Soviet songs. And uh, when I was in, in Guangdong, I traveled around in, in that part time, Hainan was part of Guangdong, and there were a lot of over old Soviet guest houses that I stayed at, you know, that were the best guest houses in those areas. And I heard a lot of things that Soviets had done. So my own instinct is to think that the Soviets really made more contributions than is, they're generally given credit for. And I think a lot of the Chinese intellectuals had pretty good relations with them. Uh, Jiang Zemin, you know, was the East European educated. Um, however, after that 1969 split, I think the, the split between the Soviet Union and China was so great. And Deng Xiaoping was certainly part of that. And he really felt that the socialist economy, the, social, the, the advice from the Soviet, and, you know, he, he learned that Khrushchev's uh, denunciation of Stalin wrecked the country, and he was not going to wreck the country by splitting it up by attacking Mao. And I think he found different ways to do things, and he felt that the private economy was mu mu much more capable of progress than the Soviet economy. And the way I read the papers very recently is that new uh, uh, <clears throat> geopolitical reasons have led the Chinese and Russians to begin to cooperate uh, on various kind of issues. Uh, so I, th I think that's very different, though, than the kind of very deep uh, relationships among specialists in the 1950s and 1960s uh, before it split apart in 1969. That's my quick perspective. Uh, how about this one? Uh, hello, my name is uh, Ryosuke Sawayama. I'm a second year uh, student at Johns Hopkins Science. Um, first of all, thank you for coming down to Washington for this uh, great lecture. Uh, my question is about the future of uh, Sino-Japanese relations. So you mentioned at the uh, end of your lecture that the current stability, the lukewarmness of politics, one of the contributing factors is the long-term uh, long leadership in both Japan and China. But um, Sure, Xi Jinping might uh, be president for life, but that doesn't mean that the, both Xi or Abe will be uh, leaders forever. So does that mean when, if either China or Japan is beleaguered by a uh, weak political leadership, should we be worried about exacerbating relations between China and Japan again? And what other contributing factors can we look for that lead to a more stable Sino-Japanese relationship? Thank you. Uh, of course, the stability requires so many things, it, a sense of common interest. I think the stable political leadership is one requirement for making very much progress on those things, uh, because uh, to really institutionalize uh, progress, you need a broad gauge uh, agreement and uh, people in the government working together to establish something. So I think that... Um, uh, that, that's what's necessary in, in uh, having some kind of political leadership. I think personally that things in China now are more difficult than a lot of people realize. If I were a leader in China, I'd be very worried about trying to maintain stability and trying, uh, uh, worrying about the country falling apart. And I think a lot of Americans uh, don't realize how much the Chinese were upset uh, when the Soviet Union fell apart and when Eastern Europe fell apart. And then they had Tiananmen after that. And now you have riots in Hong Kong. If uh, they were soft on those riots in Hong Kong, the message to people in China would be, uh, just rebel a little more and you might get what you want. They can't tolerate that. 
So I think the fact that they are cracking down so tight on the flow of information and push things uh, so hard uh, suggests that the situation in China is much more uh, <clears throat> uh, fluid and much more uh, worrisome uh, than, uh, uh, than many Americans realize. I think Americans think of the Communist Party having a tight political control, but those of us who work on China think it's much more complicated. And there are times when the uh, Communist Party, despite the unified voice that comes out at the top, that doesn't mean everything is unified down below. And I, I personally see uh, a, a lot of tensions that we hear from people, uh, who, Chinese, who come to this country. And uh, of course, in public, they have to be very careful. And they're, they're used to uh, being more careful of, about disagreeing with their leaders than we academics in the United States are. Uh, and they know how to handle that better. Uh, but that doesn't mean they completely agree with everything. So I guess I see uh, many more problems underneath the surface, more on the uh, Chinese side. But even on Japan, I think, I think that the caution and concern that comes from having experienced the, the Chinese mood in 2010 and 12 and of having had uh, their ambassador's residence in Beijing uh, stoned uh, and the experience of seeing Japanese stores in China uh, hurled. Uh, and the, the Japan does not have a, a propaganda department in the, the way that it did in World War II or the way that China has. But if you show pictures on NHK of Chinese trashing uh, your store, Ch J Japanese stores in China, it has a pretty big impact. Uh, and it has the same kind of impact that in China you might have from the propaganda department uh, passing out publicity. So I see a lot of tensions uh, there. Uh, yeah, have we got time? Actually, I think uh, we've 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 come unfortunately to the to the end of our our time, and and I know that Ezra has a an obligation pretty soon after this one, so he may have to uh, to to leave relatively quickly. But um, but before we go, um, Ezra, thank you so much for for sharing your insight and and your experience with us. This is all still very relevant to the day to day policy making that we do here in Washington and thinking about the future. And it's, it's so great that you, you bring all this back to us um, in, in, in such a rich way. And thank you to Akimoto-san and SPF USA for, for their assistance and to our team here for pulling this together. And thank you all for, for joining us.